That's what makes my blood boil. I mean, it's just I am not less than you because you are white. See that there's over 2,000 white teachers who are failing our students. You are so saying not, something not that is not study. based on a study and not based on fact. In this video, we are going to pay homage to Candace Owens to show my support for the Daily Wire who continue to have their accounts demonetized and suspended from YouTube. Here we will watch Candace Owens take on three lib professors who are quite frankly out of their depths. One by one, they try and come at Candace with different lib tricks. And one by one, she deploys various forms of ancient verbal Wing Chun to do away with her opponents. Now let's have a look at the first professor who tries to catch the smoke. But if you think about it, the SAT and ACT have historically measured access to resources, the neighborhood that you grow up in. It is not a measure of a student's drive, a student's motivation is really a measure of their access. And ultimately we know that when things measure access, they really measure um, white privilege. Well, you, you say that there can be prejudice, but not discrimination. What, what do you mean? So, well, I would separate prejudice from racism as being two different things, um, which is a do little bit different. Do you make racism and discrimination as two different things? Um, I would say that I would see prejudice and discrimination as more falling in the same, same realm. So I would say this, you can, um, the priorities that are provided within some of the, uh, the corporate incentive programs that you featured there, right? Those priorities are really not priorities. What they are is they've recognized that historically, those companies have not done a good job within their senior leadership ranks. They got 7%, 8% of their senior leaders who are from uh, minoritized communities. And so what they're doing is they're creating access to opportunity by having programs. And these are small programs. So what they're really just doing is trying to open a door. And as you try to open a door just a little bit, the accusation is, well, somehow that's not fair. But you know, what's really not fair is the history of racism and segregation in this country, which pervades to, to, to today, which is the reason why we see college admissions and companies doing these things to try to create more opportunity. But even with those opportunities that are created by these programs, they're not disadvantaging minority uh, white people, they're simply creating an opportunity. But if you make a decision based on the color of someone's skin, isn't that racist? No. If you're making a decision based upon someone, the color of someone's skin, is that racist? I would say no, because in this particular case, what you're doing is you're trying to rectify a historical wrong. One simple question from Dr. Phil, who, by the way, is undoubtedly red-pilled. He definitely smokes cigars, drinks whiskey, shoots guns, and listens to Rattlesnake TV in his spare time. If you make decisions based upon the color of people's skin, is that racist? No, it's not racist when we do it. It's only racist when you do it. Okay, Professor. Gotcha. But you see, the problem with that is that that's actually the definition of racism, to discriminate based upon skin color. And I haven't really seen any programs that are designed to help the people living in trailer parks in Appalachia. Why aren't they worried about those people? Why don't these lib professors have the same desire to put out their virtuous hands and pull them up from their position of oppression? Now onto the next part, where Candace Owens is about to bring up the man that can only be described as the kryptonite of the woke race hustling left. The one man that they wish never existed. The man who has been systematically and unequivocally debunking their BS for decades. The one whose name they do not speak. Policies are harmful also to the people that they purport to help. Um, and we have all of the evidence there to look at. Uh, when you artificially place a black American into a school in which they do not belong based on their knowledge, it doesn't mean that they go on to get A's. In fact, there was a black adjunct professor, you guys have definitely heard of him, Dr. Thomas Sowell, uh, who was teaching at Cornell University and he found that the majority of the black American students that were there were on academic probation. Now, these students were some of the smartest in the nation, but because they were artificially placed amongst their peers at Cornell University, they were failing on academic probation. These policies have never helped black Americans. It's just basically policies that are put in place to make people feel good, right? I feel like I'm doing something when in fact I'm actually creating harm. You either know the answers or you don't. Boom, and this is the problem with so many leftist 
policies. They make you feel nice and warm and fuzzy and you can say cool words like equity and you can claim to be the champions of the oppressed minorities while sitting around eating tofu and drinking kombucha with your lib friends. But the fact of the matter is that they just don't work because you cannot engineer a quality of outcome without destroying a quality of opportunity. It is actually impossible. And the admissions process is a perfect example. If you put somebody at the top of the line, somebody misses out. Why do they miss out? Because of the color of their skin. That is racist. And this is why I way, way prefer what Kevin Hart does, for example. He actually goes into these inner city communities in Harlem, for example, and he'll teach them all about financial literacy and responsibility. But you see, there's one big problem with that approach. If you teach them how to stand on their own two feet, they won't be dependent on you anymore because they may just realize that all of those opportunities that you told them they can't have because of the color of their skin were right under their noses the whole time. Now let's watch Candace continue to take scalps, but just watch closely here the language that they use. It is such a typical tactic. They hide behind fluffy words like holistic and constellation because that's all they know how to do. They can't actually break down what they mean in any logical way. And Candace is having none of it. You're right about uh, Thomas Sowell. He also said equal opportunity policies are against racism. Affirmative action is racism under new management. He said it just doesn't work. It doesn't help and never has. And he tracked this over like 50 years. Uh, and he's a, a black professor by the way. John, what do you think about this? I think that, you know, each college admissions committee that comes up with policies to consider someone's racial identity or racial background and experiences as one of many factors in the constellation of competitive factors that are considered um, is a good thing in institutions that have historically uh, excluded uh, people of color from admission uh, to their universities. Can I just ask a question? How do you consider it when we're telling you factually, in effect, it is a bad thing for the black students? What are the constellations of factors that involve them thriving or not? Is it solely due to their race? Uh, no, it's, it's due to their intellectual capabilities, which is how students should be judged. And I do want to say and one- Is that limited to just their race? It's not limited to just their race, which is why that would be an equal policy if you allowed people to be judged based on their merit, you know, on their merit and not based on their skin color. Yeah. It also, there's something about it that's very patronizing. You're a black person, so I assume that you can't get on this school based on your merit. I don't think Sasha and Malia Obama are people that have struggled and therefore should be allowed to get into the college universities on a higher basis than white kids that have worked harder than them, especially Asian Americans, which we never discuss um, and are probably the most discriminated against in this country when it comes to universities. Guys, I'm aware that some of you have watched my previous videos and not liked them and aren't subscribed to the channel. And I'm actually seeking reparations for that. So if you wouldn't mind taking a holistic approach to this very complex issue by liking the video and subscribing to the channel, that would be a great step in the right direction in terms of combating a range of social inequities and also a constellation of historical injustices perpetrated upon me, the victim. When you say, hey, we have black students at a particular school who aren't performing at that school as well, the immediate assumption that you're making is, well, maybe it's because they're not smart enough, they're, they're not good enough, or they don't belong here. Whereas it could be about the experience that they're having at that institution. Professors who believe that they're not intelligent enough, that they don't have the capability to do the work, that they see them as criminals, deviants, dangerous, up to no good, or they talk about them with the they statements. They're lazy, they don't care, they don't really belong here. Uh, you're, they're you're only here for the financial I'm giving you actual facts. No, right? I'm giving so you can, actual facts based on extensive research. You can say, well, maybe they just don't feel done. good, um, but that's not the case. I mean, I went, I went to university. I did not feel good, right? I, I didn't pull the best grades in high school, probably got into a better university than I should have gotten into based on my performance in high school. It wasn't because of my feelings. It's because I wasn't focused on it. And that we're talking about a cultural problem, what's going on back at home, as was in my circumstance. And none of that is because of institutionalized policy. Um, it almost seems like you guys refuse to accept that you know black students aren't performing well you feel like you have to have this burden of responsibility when in fact if you actually wanted to help you would look at the facts re-examine the fact that it's not helping anybody it's not helping black americans to artificially place them into universities and you'd make effective change but you're making the assumption that black students are academically inferior and they're not no, some are of our most actually, that's, brilliant that's, that's students the, that's that the basic no, no no that you are making the assumption that they are inferior you just said that they don't belong policies there. <laughs> 
I'm talking about the students that are based on the policies that you are defending right now, saying that we should have these policies that let them into these universities, not based on their skill set, but based on the color of their skin. So you are assuming that they are inferior. These people are no match for Candace, and they do not belong on a stage with her. And you may be wondering, if you give them a chance to get into a college that they wouldn't have otherwise gotten into, surely that helps, right? They get a better education, it evens up the playing field, and the utopia of uniformity can be achieved. Wrong. And that's where Dr. Thomas Sowell comes in with his inconvenient facts. But ladies and gentlemen, the truth is often far less palatable than virtue signaling. And this is why these professors choose not to look at the empirical facts and evidence, because this would require time and effort and also going against their peer group. They would have to find ways to explain uncomfortable realities, and hence they wouldn't be a part of the cool kids club on campus anymore. Thomas Sowell has written a plethora of books, including Black Rednecks and White Liberals, Discrimination and Disparities, and also Affirmative Action Around the World, where he compares affirmative action in America to the many different programs that are similar across the world. And I won't get into the weeds of it now, but if you guys do want to see me do a deep dive into that subject or any other subjects that Thomas Sowell has covered for that matter, leave it in the comments. But one such example that he cites is that when California banned affirmative action, black students started to graduate at far higher rates than before. They got much better GPAs and they were doing much better in subjects like math and engineering because the students were now going to the parts of the university system that better fitted their academic preparation. So they were studying at their own level rather than being put into these courses where they're out of their depths and flunking out. And guys, I was a terrible student. I got a really bad score at the end of high school. It's called an ATAR score where I'm from. And if they had have taken me and then put me into some high level university, I would have 100% failed. But back to Candace, and this language always amuses me so much. This guy actually thinks that he sounds really smart and that he's making a good point because he keeps saying the word constellation. And unfortunately, guys, he's not done with it yet. Him and his professor buddy are about to take the buzzwords to a new level. But it's about to get a lot better for us guys because Candace Owens is now being backed up by the very intelligent Amala Ekpenobi from Prager U. What do you think about what we're talking about so far? Right, uh, I'll talk to your example that you gave about the Monopoly game and a white person being able to run the track twice over and a black person starting after that. Uh, the solution is not to then pick up the black person and run them around the lap four times. The solution is to fix the game and make that equal, which would be a race neutral future. We should not be looking at race when it comes to college admissions at all. And when it comes to things like affirmative action, if we truly said we cared about minorities, it wouldn't be disproportionately affecting Asian Americans, as Candace said, like it is now. Why do we not care about that minority group? We absolutely care about all minority groups, just like we care about all students. But I think everyone has a significant misunderstanding of these policies. They're comprehensive or holistic in nature. This is one factor among many other factors. And then we say across all those factors, looking at these and taking them in tandem, is this student best prepared? Because it's not just about your intelligence, mm -hmm. that's important, it's also about your drive, about your resilience, about your ability to overcome challenges, and that's what makes you successful. Even with those factors taken into account, Asian students and white students are discriminated against when compared to their black counterparts. How is that the case? And it seems that with affirmative action, we've dictated we care about black students, we care about Hispanic students. These are the minorities who are going to benefit Let's from not this, Native and Americans. Asians are not, and Native Americans. But the through line is not necessarily socioeconomic status. It doesn't seem to be resources. It seems to be that these are the minority groups that we feel bad for. We don't feel bad for Asian Americans because they have a culture of high academic standing. They have a culture of drive and of, of facing adversity. We look at black students and Hispanic students and Native American that's students. We are inferior and, and that we is pity what, them. That's what makes my blood boil. I mean, it's just, I am not less than you because you are white. I don't need you to look at me and feel bad for me because of the color of my skin. And that's effectively what you're doing. Every time you take an application, you say, oh, well, this girl's black, so I kind of feel bad for her. So I'm going to put her at the top of a line. It's just, it's just not necessary. I believe, right? that black Americans are capable of performing in the same capacity as their white peers. You two don't actually believe that. I because actually believe if you that. support affirmative action, you are basically saying that black Americans cannot do it on their own. No, what I'm saying is that there's a history of racism and exclusionary practices. That instead, we're reducing it all, the, all, down, all the way down just to race. And what these admissions practices are actually doing is saying, no, 
there's a constellation of factors that we're considering in the holistic review of this application. So race from the applications is basically making it about race. You're saying these are the black people, these are the white people, these are the Asian people, these are the Native American people, as you mentioned. But as one of the audience members said, what about people who are of mixed race? You know, I'm of mixed background. What am I supposed to mark on an application? Am I supposed to mark multiple boxes? And plus, mark if you black. are painting people mark as black. an oppressor, if you're white, That's and a terrible saying thing to that tell you're Well, it's the truth, because you believe in affirmative action. So I said, mark black. If you're a then, mixed student, I, I'm, in a, I'm an interracial relationship, so I can speak to this. I have a son that's half white, and a son that's half black, and a daughter that's half white and half black. Okay. They're going to mark black because I know that there are people like you at the universities who will say, well, because this person is black, I'm just going to let them in. No, That's they're going to mark black because they're black. Well, they're <laughs> half black and half white. They're, 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 they're both, right? So it is true. You overlook yes, inter half black and right. half white. So you I'm overlook, black. You overlook <laughs> interracial students. But so why? what do you mean? Why are you saying, That's, yeah, they're going to mark black because they're black? I socialize in our society. So the answer is, if you, you can't, I mean, you can mark both. Can you mark both? I don't know if you can. Yes. What are you going to look at that applicant as a little bit less because they're half white? How do you guys figure that out? How they look at it is, again, holistically, holistically uh, across a number word. of different I factors. Buzzword. I love me a buzzword. Holistically and racial consciousness. Oh, yeah. Reverse discrimination. A it's buzzword. not reverse discrimination. It's just discrimination. discrimination. It's just racism if you're judging people on the basis of their skin color. I don't know why this is so difficult. I mean, you have to go to a, through an extraordinary amount of school. You ha almost have to have a PhD to not be able to see this. But we're talking about the holistic admissions, and we're talking about how that, and, and I know you don't like that word, but that's just true. It. That's what it's called. Our comprehensive, you can call it that, too. So once again, Nice sounding words, they make you want to eat a salad and drink a fruit smoothie and go stargazing, but they actually don't solve anything. In fact, they do the opposite. And Candace Owens raised a great point here, and this is actually something that's a big issue because unlike gender, race is actually a spectrum. How black does one actually have to be to qualify for this? And once you keep going down this path, you realize that there is actually no logic to this whatsoever. And that's why you get people like Elizabeth Pocahontas Warren, the audacity to claim to be Native American. So Candace did a great job there of handling the holistic constellation like an absolute champion. But now on to another very common lib tactic. The next one who tries to come at Candace, which I wouldn't recommend any mere mortal do, comes with the old smiling compassionate tactic. A tactic that is all too often deployed when one is trying to put up a fake facade of virtue. Well, a lawsuit has been filed over a new teacher retention policy at Minneapolis Public Schools that critics say uh, could result in white teachers being laid off first. Now, joining us virtually is a Minneapolis school teacher, Alexis, who wants to explain what has been happening in her district. So, Alexis, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, there's a lot more to this than the headlines, correct? Absolutely. What is the issue? Because there is some, it has to do with seniority and... Underrepresentation. Right. Those are the words that were used. Okay, and the fact is, the vast majority of the teachers there are white, correct? That's correct. And so, if you just go just straight proportionality, there are naturally going to be more white teachers released than black teachers because there are just more in the pool. Well, if you even look at our last um, accessing cycle, there were roughly 150 or so teachers that were laid off. 50 of those teachers were black. So um, you, you're always going to have, anytime you're, you're dealing with a layoff situation where you have, let me, let me just give you the exact numbers, Minneapolis Public Schools, we have, there are a total of 237 black teachers. Of those black teachers, 147 of them are tenured versus 200, I'm sorry, 2,652 white teachers of which uh, 2,129 are tenured. So um, clearly there is a disproportionate amount of white teachers versus black teachers. So the current policies that are in place favor uh, continuing to have the same policies that produce these numbers. Yeah, so what part of that does favor retaining the black teachers? It's not a black and white issue. It says underrepresented. So it protects uh, teachers from underrepresented populations, which underrepresented could be based on sexuality. It could be based on gender. So to just cover it in a racial 
identification, I think, is wrong. It doesn't matter how good you teach. If you don't have a relationship with the student, you won't be as effective as you could be. And our faculty of color and staff of color tend to do that. You're talking about the art of teaching. You're talking about building relationships. They are actually failing when it turns when it comes to actually teaching these kids things. This Who, is why who's black, failing? I'm, I'm telling you, inner city communities. I'm talking about Baltimore, Baltimore, Minneapolis, Los Angeles. All of the inner city communities are failing black children because they're focusing on the art and not the actual facts. In Baltimore, we're talking just about one teacher example, diversity, though. I'm, you're I'm, referring I'm, to the full density of the school. I'm talking about the art of teaching, which you're saying they're better for the student. They're actually not better for the student, right? So you're saying Across that faculty five of color are not effective. In Baltimore, which is an inner city, which focuses as I suppose on the art of teaching, they couldn't find a single black child, a single child that was proficient in reading and writing because they think that having somebody who looks like you somehow means that it's going to be better. And also, please, I have to clarify this because when we talk about these quotas and someone says, well, there's this many white people teaching and there's this many black people teaching, welcome to America. Black Americans, okay, I don't know how everybody's doing in their math these days. Black Americans represent just 13% of the population, okay, right? White Americans represent 60% of the population, okay? So if you walk into a room and you find that there's only 13% of the room that is black American and 60% of the room is white American, you are actually walking into a room that is holistic, a room that actually represents America. You can't just say we want black Americans to represent 90% of people in every single room. It just won't work But in her district, there's okay. only 5% of those teachers are-, are Alexis, you want to say something? Color. Actually, do Candace. Let me let you know that I am a teacher, and I just had a conversation with a student last week. She, we're like I said, half of the staff at the school where I work, we're black or uh, teachers of color, and we are a uh, school where students come on a, we'll say, temporary basis. It's not a destination school. So, in preparing the student to transition to their new school that that is a mainstream school, one of the things that that student said is that I want to stay here. I want to stay here because there's more black teachers here and I feel more comfortable around black teachers. So I, I just want you to know that it's not necessarily a matter of the students, the art of teaching that makes these students feel more comfortable, but there is research and science that shows that when you have a teacher that looks like you in your classroom, you do better. And also I just wanted to say with respect they're to not doing the, better. the numbers, that's my point. Uh, with, respect, with respect to the numbers, that's because you see the numbers, right? You see that there's over 2000 white teachers who are failing our students versus the 237 in the district that are getting cycled around to different schools that's based on hiring policy. That's just incorrect. That's just incorrect. Yeah. You, you no, are saying not, something not, that is not based on a study no. and not based on facts. No. Just because no. a teacher looks like you does not mean that you are going to perform no. better in that class based on your no. academic abilities. Coming up, how do we address Oh, how I would love, with all of my heart, to see Candace and this teacher sitting across from one another for two hours and doing a long form podcast. We started to see the compassionate, kind, virtue smile mask come down a little bit when she was talking about white teachers, but I genuinely think that it would take Candace Owens no longer than three minutes to produce the full on raging Marxist behind the smile. But her argument there was that these students are doing a lot better when they have black teachers because black teachers look like them and it makes them feel more comfortable. Okay, teacher. Firstly, school shouldn't be fully about making kids feel comfortable. If anything, hearing something like that from a student should be an instant red flag and they should be thinking this kid needs to expand their horizons and is most likely very brainwashed. Secondly, Candace is absolutely right, saying that these inner city schools are not doing so great. And thirdly, let's try and avoid arguing for racial segregation, so 1950s. So guys, moral of the story here is be very, very wary of the smiling, compassionate, social justice type and just want to fight for equity. And their virtue is manifest by the fact that when I talk, I'm smiling. See, when I talk, I'm smiling, so I must be a good person. Psychopath. That's it from me, guys. Make sure to go find me on Twitter. I'm just getting off my training wheels, finding my way in the world of Twitter. Everything is always in flux, but I'm getting there. And if you guys want to watch another video, click right here. Until next time, I'm Jake. This is Rattlesnake TV, keeping you armed and dangerous.